Okay. Um, there are many linguists that, uh, cons I mean, that involve themselves in linguistics uh, for a long, long time. Uh, remember that last time that I mentioned about uh, the beginning of uh, linguistic? Linguistic is quite a very new um, academic field occur in our uh, science of uh, studying because uh, you know that long time ago I mean back to 1000 or 2000 years we have mathematics we have arithmetics we have science and we have something more like uh, uh, the basic knowledge biology chemistry so on and so forth linguistic just started uh, by the middle of uh, 19th century. So I think that later than when we, uh, James Watt started the, uh, the uh, machine for our you know, uh, modern, um, let's say that uh, uh, train and transportation vehicles, so on and so forth, including the electricity, right? But uh, linguistic just started later than that. So that's why um, there are some people involved themselves in this field, so they just try to give explanation by giving definitions of the technical terms that we are going to use. Um, so, for example, like uh, this guy, uh, he is very specialized in morphology, and uh, his text that's supposed to be the Bible, you know, of uh, linguistics on uh, morphology. I know that everybody who studied uh, morphology would know his, uh, this uh, Uji Nida, that uh, back in 1965, he just gave definition or he defined the uh, meaning of uh, morphology, that if you study the word, I think that you can find the, the book uh, in, in the library, in your library, otherwise you can click to uh, Narethon University and you just link because uh, MCU and Arizona University, we have some kind of uh, memorandum of understanding together, so you can use and you can access because uh, <clears throat> I think that Arizona University has a kind of uh, automation and uh, the uh, online system of uh, borrowing and uh, you know returning the books, so you can uh, start and take a look at this book. And if you are interested in details, you can read a lot from uh, Nida's uh, morphology. So according to his book, Morphology, the Descriptive Analysis of Words, you know, um, he said that uh, morphology is the study of morphemes. You see, now we have the technical term morphology. What does it mean? You know, morphology is a kind of uh, um, biology term, right? And then we have come to the, um, to the new term again, uh, morphemes. So the study of morphemes, what is, the, what is the meaning of morphemes? So this is what we are going to discuss together. Okay, so morphology is the study of morphemes and their arrangement in forming words. So another technical term that involved in morphology is words, right? So we have to words that we have to make a clarification on this, morpheme and words. They are very related together this way. Okay, uh, according to Eugene Nieder, he said that mor morphology is the study. You see that when you have <clears throat> the term logic at the end of any word, it means study. So you have biology, it means that you are going to study about the bio, I mean the life and the uh, life chains of uh, animals, uh, uh, human beings and plants, so on and so forth, right? So morphology is the study of morphemes, see? Not only just know the meaning of morpheme, but you have to learn about the arrangement of the morphemes in forming words. So it means that morpheme and words are connected to each other. They are very close, so we can say that they are close friends, right? So another 
meaning of uh, morpheme or morphology by another linguist. When I talk about linguists, I mean the one who uh, write books and texts about linguistics and just keep on doing research, you know, and uh, uh, present to the world about what uh, they are working on. So, according to Daniel Jurovsky and James Martin, so both of them, they have uh, written a book on speech and language processing. Okay? That is later on in 2009. You see that this is very contemporary to our uh, period, right? So according to uh, Jurovsky and Martin, uh, they explain, they talk about morphology, that it is the study of the way that words are built up from smaller meaning-bearing units. Meaning-bearing means uh, something that takes the meaning. So meaning-bearing units, that is morphemes, according to uh, Uji Nida, right? So that is the same meaning. It means that, okay, if when, when you study uh, the language, so that you can use language to be the tool of your communication, you have to study the way that words, because you know, when you speak the language or you write the language, you write and you speak in words put together. So, morphology will be the study of the way words are built up from morphemes. So this is the meaning by Jurovsky and James Martin. Okay. If you read another book, um, you will get another way of uh, defining morpheme. You see, if you take a look at the book, okay, later, uh, the year later, in 2010, uh, one guy, Rochelle Lieber, has written a book named Introducing Morphology. Okay? And he explained that morphology is the study. So every time when you have logic at the end of the word, you have to uh, interpret as study. So it means the study of word formation, including the way new words are coined. Coined means to put you know, in the language of the world. And the way forms of words are vary depending on how they are used in the sentences. Now look, we have another term, formation. Formation means you know to create, to build up, to make in the form make to be seen by eyes, heard by ears, you know, and touched by hand, so on and so forth. If we are going to study about forming the words, put the words, you know, in the forms, and the way that uh, the new words are coined, mean put together in the language of the world. So you see that you study morphemes. You will talk about morphology. Another way that uh, when we give the meaning to morphology, it is the way that forms of words, you know, different forms of the word, are varied. Are varied means different depending on how they use in the sentences. So this is the way that they define the word morphology. So by Rochelle Lieber, you have another word, formation, you have the word coined, and you have varied, and you have the word sentences, right? So it means that morphology just involves with words and sentences, and the way that they change, the way, the way they use differently from each other, and you have uh, morphology involved with the new words of the language. So, the new words mean 
the words that you don't know. You don't know the structure, you don't know the meaning, you don't know the function. So it is the way that we study morphology. So morphology, according to the definitions, it is, um, it includes, you know, word formation, right? Uh, try to find the smaller units that you call morpheme. What is it? How can you get it? And how can you put morphemes together uh, to make words? And then how can the words are put in the sentences of any language? That is the way that we are going to talk about morphology. Okay, now according to the definitions, you see that uh, we uh, have some terms or some words. I, I don't want to use the word, it's going to be very confusing with the, uh, the linguistic terminology that we are going to use later on. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to use the word term, yeah, like morpheme is a term, word is another term, and sentences is another term, right? So, now we come to the first one, according to Nida, he said that uh, morphology is the study of uh, morphemes are put into uh, words. So what is a morpheme? This is the question that we have to ask before we get the meaning from different linguistic texts that you would like to take a look. I would like to tell you one thing. Linguistic texts, most of them seem to be very, not very easy to read, to understand because they use a lot of terminology. We have a lot of academic terms that you have to learn and to know the meaning. This is why, because this kind of, uh, you know, I would say that is a kind of uh, sign of language, you see. When we study science, so we are going to have some terms that we have to clarify. So uh, according to linguistic, of course, they use the word morpheme. What does it mean? Don't spell, don't pronounce it wrongly, okay? It is morpheme, not morphine. Uh -huh. So according to the definition by most of the linguists, the meaning is, one, the meaning of, uh, one definition of morpheme is the minimal meaningful unit. Now, you see that when we talk about morpheme, we are going to have form and meaning, right? So this is the minimal, minimal means smallest. The smallest meaningful unit that may constitute, constitute means create, the word or part of word. Part of word means, you know, not the full form of a word, but part of it. So it means that morpheme can be a part of the word or can be a word, okay? This is what we have to make understanding together first, right? And uh, if you would like to take a look at the example, okay, English is our, uh, well, supposed to be the common language that we, are, we can discuss together among eight of you, that uh, in English, we have a lot of morphemes, like uh, re, in the word retry, the word de, in the word demand, the word I'm sorry, the morpheme, un, mean untie. You know the meaning, right? We have uh, morpheme ish, like boyish. We have morpheme li, means likely. We have morpheme sieve, like in the word deceive. We have morpheme man, in the word command. You see that these kind of morphemes have the meaning. You know the meaning. Okay? Banjob, can you tell me the meaning of re? You know that? Mean again and again. Retry mean try again and again. You know. And how about the meaning of D? D E D in the word demand. D means away or just go out of something, okay? So, re, d, an, ish, li, sif, man have the meaning by themselves. But they are just part of the word. 
because if you would like to get the word, you have to get the word on the right hand that I show you here. Okay, but sometimes the minimal, the minimal meaningful unit that is morpheme can constitute word. For example, you have Thai, you have boy, you have like that can occur by themselves. And these three are considered as well as morpheme. Okay? So sometimes morpheme can act like word. Sometimes morpheme can act like part of word. You see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And another meaning of morpheme, if uh, you study Lieber or uh, Jorowski, the meaning of a morpheme is the minimal meaning bearing unit. You see, these people later on, after uh, Nida or Ujin, they don't like the word morpheme very much because it's a, a kind of uh, rather very technical. So they just try to explain the, um, the, that term in ordinary or very common uh, form of, of uh, speaking or writing. So instead of saying the minimal uh, meaningful unit they are going to say that the minimal meaning bearing unit in a language. So that is morpheme. Okay? Now you come to the word language. How come morpheme and language are interact? Okay? Last time we have discussed about uh, the meaning of a language that Okay, what is a language? This is one definition or one explanation or one description about a language. If you take a look at the dictionary, for example, in general dictionary, uh, for example, if you take a look at Webster or Oxford or you know even Reader Digest dictionary, you will get the meaning of language different from each other. But anyway, by um, all means, yeah. A language is the method of human communication, right? Either spoken or written. So what you speak out or what you have written out can be a language. Okay? But the communication that way must be consisted or they consist of the use of words. See? The language must use words in a structure and conventional way. You have to get the way that you speak or you write that you call language. It must be in the structure design or assigned by the speakers. And it must be in conventional way. I mean the way that they put words together so uh, what we call grammar by now, you must have fixed this word can occur here, this word must occur over there, this word, these two words can occur together, these two words cannot occur together. That is we call conventional way of uh, building up the language to be communicated to into society, okay? And, uh, okay, that is the way that morphemes are related to language. Because, why? Because morphemes are part of the words. So, now another question that we are going to ask ourselves. What is the relation between word and morpheme? Okay? So, um, by this way, according to the definition, we can see the relation between word and morpheme. So, it can be 
explain that one or more morphemes that can stand alone in a language. Okay. And another way that morpheme can occur in the language. The single distinct meaningful element of speech or writing form by one morpheme or combination of morphemes. So it means that in the language we can have one or more morphemes. I mean two morphemes, three morphemes can stand alone in the language. Or sometimes we get another meaningful elements that we can speak or we can write down that consists of one morpheme or combination of morpheme or more than two together. Like uh, you see that we have the first one, you see, this would be uh, the kinds or the type of words in general. If one or more morpheme stand alone in a language, we call simple or simplex word, you know, just simple means one, you have one, okay? If you have the elements of these meaningful of morphemes, you know, occur together, you know, uh, that you put another morpheme with another morpheme or another two morphemes with another morpheme, this way we call the compound or a complex word depends. This is what we are going to discuss further, okay? So you just uh, clarify to yourself right here that we have three types of words in general. General, I mean in any language. So the common feature sometimes we call the linguistic term used universal properties or universal elements. It means something that share the same thing in every language of the world. This is what we call general. So it means that every language in this world can form the word, their words, as either simple or compound or complex. But it means that sometimes in one particular language, you probably don't have the simple word at all. You have only compound or complex, you see. How do you know? You have to notice, you have to observe, and you have to study. That's why I mentioned before that if you know more than one language, this is your advantage, you see. And if you know more than ten, oh, that is, uh, you know, the prosperity of yourself to stand anywhere in this world. But if you know only one, you just have very rigid knowledge about what language works in communication system. So, in general, or in every language, the words can be either simple or compound or complex, right? Example of this, we can see, okay, take English as the example. When we talk about English word forms, see, for the simple form of words or the simplex word, you know, simplex is a kind of just make the word go together with uh, complex, right? The simple or the simplex word in English, like uh, the word flag, tiger, buffalo, house, you see, it doesn't mean that simple must be short. It can be long, as long as it contains one meaning in each time that you use, okay? The compound word in English, for example, you have two words put together, two morphemes put together, 
one is steam and another one is boat. So you have the word in English means something. Mean steamboat, right? You have the word black that we call morpheme. You know, that is one morpheme because black has one meaning in here. And you have the word or the morpheme bird. You know, this is uh, the uh, another morpheme. So you have two words or two morphemes, two standing alone morphemes. Remember that when we talk about morpheme, don't get confused. One morpheme can be word or two morphemes can be word or more than two can be words. Depends on the way that the English people, they built up their language. Okay, here you have two morphemes or two words, black and bird. And then you have blackbird. Blackbird does not mean that the bird which is black, but blackbird means a kind of bird. See? So that is another meaning that when you put, you know, when you compile, compile means put together. And in English, you have the word base. Base means fundamental, you know, in the, uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the floor of anything. And you have the word or the morpheme ball, right? When you put these two morphemes or two words together, baseball, it does not mean that the ball which is on the floor or on the, uh, the ground or anything, but baseball is another name of a kind of sport, right? So this is the way that language are formed from words, and words are formed with morpheme, okay? The example of a complex word in English, for example, you have pre-morpheme, and this morpheme cannot stand alone. It cannot occur by itself. It has to go with other morpheme, okay? We have went as morpheme. And went does not occur alone. But when you put pre and went together, and you pronounce it as prevent, so it means something, right? You have, in English, morpheme box. Can box occur alone? Yes. And you have morpheme er. Can er occur alone? No. You have to put with, you know, another morpheme. Here, you have boxer, right? And here you have another morpheme, z. So this you pronounce as boxers. That z has meaning? Yes. It made the word boxer to be plural, right? But z and er do not occur alone. They cannot occur by themselves, but they are still act as morphemes. See, box is a word and it is also morpheme. So we have here morpheme, one box, two er, and three z. So this is boxes. When you write it down, you write together like this. If you want to make this plural, okay? In English, you have morpheme, love. This morpheme can stand alone by itself. You have only the word love occur everywhere, right? 
in English. But in linguistic, we say that we call this is a kind of one morpheme that can stand alone. Okay, and probably later on we are going to have this kind of technical term for this uh, situation that I'm going to tell you later on. Okay, in English, you have li. Is it morpheme? When you talk about morpheme, you have to try to think about the meaning. Okay, everybody here, eight of you know English very well. I understand that. Okay, li. What does it mean? Li means make the form that it attach. It is attached to be adjective adverb, right? So love in English, okay, function something. For example, now or verb. And li when put together with love, lovely, it becomes uh, adverb. So. Or adjective in some sense. So this is the way that we talk about the morpheme in one particular language. I tell you, English is one language that seems to be different from the other languages as well. You know, even though they have the same simple word, compound word. I mean, you can, they can put two morphemes together, and uh, those two, uh, you know, stand alone morpheme together, or they can put uh, the morpheme that cannot stand alone with the morpheme that cannot stand alone, or they can put the morpheme that can stand alone and the morpheme that cannot stand alone after, you know, like the word boxer, er, come up, comes after, and prevent, pre comes before. Okay, so it means that you see that morpheme and words are very related to each to each other. So, um, and why do we study morpheme? Because we have to know morpheme. I mean, instead of to study, okay, why do you have to know morphemes? Because when we are going to communicate. We have to start from the smallest unit that is morpheme, because morpheme that uh, we have that we know are going to constitute themselves into the form of words, and the words will constitute themselves to form sentences into the language. Okay. So if we discuss about relevancy to language structure. You know the relevancy of morphemes to the language structure. The question that we are going to ask ourselves is that where is morphology? The study of morphemes. Where is morphology in language structure? You know, when you talk about the language structure, you know that uh, usually when we talk about the language, we have some common terms or. We call common uh, terminology. Okay, you all know that uh, you understand the word utterances or utterance, right? You know chapter. So it means that we, when we communicate uh, with each other, we can either speak or write as long as we want. That's why language can be created indefinitely. You just keep on and on. If you would like to speak, you know, you can utter. Utter means speak out for days and nights as long as you can. But you know, when people communicate, they would end up in you know they have a break because you cannot speak all day all night. You have to do something else. See, you you are very tired if you speak too long. You will be very tired if you just write too long. So usually, the utterances would be, you know, not, not as long as we can do. The chapters seem to be the longest, you know, 
uh, part of the language that you use to communicate. Well, uh, smaller than that, you have sentence, right? Sometimes we just speak out uh, only one sentence because if you meet someone and you don't like that person very much, you don't want to communicate with him or with her too long. So, if uh, he or she start talking to you, how are you today? Is it okay? And you just say, yes, okay, finish. That is sentence. Or you can speak longer, use more sentences than one sentence that you write. It depends on what you want, or it depends on your need, or depends on your feeling to uh, utter, to speak out, or to write out. Sometimes you see that uh, we probably get, uh, well, according to as the parents, we probably get uh, letters written by our children if they are living far away. You know, dear dad, yeah. no man, no fun from son. Very short. Sometimes you get a letter very long, two, three pages, telling about what uh, he or she living uh, there, what kind of people they meet, you know, what kind of subject causes they just uh, confronted, so on and so forth. Depends on the sentence, so can be short or long, but you have to communicate in sentences. Because if you don't use the sentence, it, no matter what, short or long, if you don't make sentences, people don't understand you. I mean, people in, in, in the same society, people who speak the same language as you do, will not understand you. So this is the reason that you know you have to learn when you would like to communicate, you have to learn how to uh, construct the uh, sentences, right? That's why we come to school. We have to learn to form sentences so that we can be able to communicate with people. Why we have to communicate with people? Because we cannot live alone in this world. You have to get friends. You have to know people. You have to talk to people. You have to write to people. Because we are social animals. That's what uh, I mean. Okay? And how can you make sentences? You have to know about the phrase. You know phrase or phrases. The phrase means the group of words that put together that you are going to uh, make it function somewhere in the sentence. It is not complete yet. That's why we have to learn how to use phrase to form sentence, right? For example, you know that in English, you have the word now phrase, verb phrase, prepositional phrase, something like that, adverbial phrase, adjective phrase, so on and so forth. So this is the way that you have to learn from where? from school. What is your school? Text? You know, right now YouTube, right now Google, right now Yahoo, so on and so forth, or the library, or the teacher in the classroom that you have to learn. Okay, how can you get fresh? You have to learn how to form words. See? Because if you are going to make sentence, you have to have words. We cannot speak the word, only one word, all the time. For example, someone talk to you. Do you understand me when I said? And you said, yes. You understand what he said, that one who is sitting next to me? And you said no. You see that if you just use only one word like that all the time, people would assume that you are dumb, stupid, you know, 
or you are not very friendly. So we just cannot just speak, all right? Yes, no. Yes, no. Okay. You know, all the time. It doesn't show. And then finally, you are going to lose faith. You are going to lose proper uh, popularity in the society. No one should like to communicate with you, and that is the way that you are going to be suffer living in this world. To be accepted is the most important thing that everybody looks for. Is that right? That's why you have to know the one who can use beautiful language will be easily accepted as a smart as clever and friendly, and then he or she will get popularity, see, from the society members. That is the way that people get happiness, okay? Now, the way that uh, words are used in the language, you have to know how to form the words. You know, in the common terminology, we have the word Syllable. You know syllable? Syllable is the combination of the sounds. So sound is the smallest. If you speak the language, another thing that you have to try to learn and to get is meaning. If you learn about the meaning of utterance, of sentence, of phrase, of word, of syllable, of sound, and then it means that you can master the language. See, this is the way that they use terminology. We understand every word that I have written on the right hand here. But in linguistics, we have also terminology. If you speak or write very long, as long as you want, you know, and then finally you are so tired, exhausted, you just put period. You know? And then it means that we call this course in linguistic. This course means the utterances or the longest uh, spoken or the written forms that a person can do. You see? It doesn't mean with the length, it, this course can be short like two, three lines, or it can be very long, like uh, 20, 100 pages. It can be this course. If it contains only one topic, for example, today I speak to you for three hours on one topic, morphology. So I'm going to give you only one discourse today, you see. If you just speak of this and that, here and there, you know, so many things, it means that you are using these courses, mean many, many topics for today. Where shall we eat tonight? Okay, did you study before? Now, how about the the um, computer over there, you see, many, many topics. So you have many discourse. I'm going to tell you because later on, if you are going to pay attention to the real linguistic, you have to try to learn about uh, analyzing this course of the language. But here we know that no matter how long or short, but if the language is about only one thing or one topic we call this course, okay? So, under the this course, we have many sentences, right? And the study about sentences in linguistic we call syntax. Okay? Syntax is the same as sentence. But syntax is a term that when you study, but sentence is a term that you build up yourself, okay?
So when you study uh, linguistic about syntax, you have to learn how to form sentences, how to break up sentences into small piece, smaller pieces, and you have to learn about how to use it, and you have to know when uh, the sentences are uh, functioning in the language, so on and so forth. That is the way that couple the meaning of syntax. Under syntax is a kind of uh, lexicology. Lexicology, it means the study of lexemes. You see, L-E-X-E-M-E, -E -E, lexeme. What does it mean? Lexeme, I'm going to give you the meaning below. But here, lower than lexicology, now we come to morphology. It means the study of either word or parts of words, see, that contain meaning. And if you just study about the meaningful unit that is morpheme or word, and put together into sentences, that is grammar, you know, we get. And how can you build up, how can you form morpheme? When you study morpho morphology, you are going to study phonology at the same time, okay? It means that phonology means the study of sounds. So you are going to study what kind of sounds are there in a language? How many sounds are there in one particular language system? How can we get the sound? How can we form the sound to make it morpheme? What are the rules that we are going to put the sound into morpheme? What are the rules that we are going to put morpheme into the form of lexic lexeme? How can we put the lexeme? How can we choose the lexemes? Uh, properly to make sentences, something like this, you know. So this is the way that uh, when you study linguistics, you have to cover all of these terms if you are going to discuss about the uh, structure of a language. Because in one particular language, uh, there are utterances. If you are going to study about utterances, it means that you are working on this course analysis. If you are going to study about sentences, how can they put together and form the utterances? We say that you are taking syntax, so on and so forth, you okay? see? And in the language, of course, when you communicate with someone, you have to show the meaning. Because if you would like to make people understand you, you have to make them understand by giving the meaning. And in linguistic, there are some causes. And there is another field of linguistic that you can pay concentrate on, you know, that we call semantics. Semantics is the study of meaning of everything of the sound, of the syllable, of the word, of the phrase, of the sentences, of the utterances, of the chapter, so on and so forth. So if you are going to write a passage about one thing, something, you know, one topic, you are just studying this course, the good one, you see. So this course can be many things, paragraph, passage, chapter, book, so on and so forth, as long as you can read, as long as you can write, as long as you can speak, okay? So this is the way that we are going to relate morphology into the language. So if you take a look on your right, uh, left hand, you see the word morphology, right? So that means morphology is between lexicology and phonology. What kind of uh, lexicology? Lexicology 
is the study of form, meaning of the form, and the use of word in the language. And each unit of the form that has meaning and function in the language we call lexeme. So lexeme, you see that one form can take a lot of meanings. You see, many form can take one meaning. That is the way that we study about this. And if you study the function and the forms and the meaning of uh, this kind of unit, we call that you are studying lexemes and the subject is called lexicology. Okay? So, usually lexemes will be put in something else in the form like dictionary and so on that we are going to discuss about this uh, later on, right? Um, I think that I will uh, give you a little break before we go on uh, this way. And I stop here for five minutes, so it give you a time to relax a little bit. And when we come back later, what we are going to uh, talk about morpheme types, okay? Now, so after fetching yourself, we are going to continue because it's very exciting. You know, I don't know whether I'm the only one who is excited, but uh, uh, when we talk about the morphology, I, there are so many things that we have to to know. Not only the definition of the word, but also we have to take a look at the inner parts of this kind of uh, study. So, when we talk about morphemes, it doesn't mean that, you know, one form, one meaning, like uh, you understand, but we are going to see the complexity of uh, how we can, how we create uh, the shape or the form, you know, of these kind of units just to make a language. You see, language, is the expression of uh, someone. In the body of each person, it's so complex. You see, this is why the Buddha, when he preached us, he mentioned that there are four hardest things in this world. The most difficult things in this world, there are four of them. And you know that one of them is to be human being, okay? So, uh, Venerable uh, uh, Sila Nanta and uh, Venerable Andiya can explain to the class about another three hardest things that are uh, not very uh, you know, normally or easily happen in this world. Okay, you see that why it's very difficult or it is very hard to be a human being because our body is very complex, you know. Our organs are very complex. If you, for example, if you lose one part of your body, for example, liver, if you lose your liver, you cannot live, right? If you lose your heart, you know, if somebody cut your heart, you cannot live anymore, something like that. So language is the representative of our body and mind. So we express from our thought into the form of language. Of course, it is complexity that way. Well, okay. Now, come back to the types of the morphemes. So it means that uh, the, there are uh, one or two or more or what else that we, we can take a look together. But I just tell you that, uh, let me tell you, in this world, I mean, among the 6,500 uh, um, um, languages spoken in this world, 
um, one common feature that all those uh, 6,500 share together is that in this world, in this world of languages, there are two main types of morphemes in every language. It means that if the language either has three morphemes, either one particular language has only bow morphemes. Either that particular language, another particular language, has both free and bow, or uh, either one particular language has only bow and bow. See, but all of them, all those six thousand five hundred languages can have two types, you know, two major types of morpheme, free form morpheme and bow morpheme. What does it mean by that, you know? In another particular language can have another kind of morpheme, you see? It means that uh, we, you know the name uh, affix, right? So one particular language might have only free or free plus bow, or free plus bow plus affix, or bow plus affix, or free plus affix. You know, it depends on your study of uh, one particular language that you are interested in. When we talk about the multi morpheme types, you know, you understand free, right? Free means stand alone. Bow means cannot stand alone. Affix means you have to attach. You know. There are two positions that you can attach or you can fix the morphemes in the form of the language. So usually um, you can have affix that put in the front that we call, you know, that you precede another morpheme. So we call prefix, right? In one particular language, we probably have something, some morpheme that is put after, I mean follow another form, other morphemes that we call that one that follows, you know, suffix, okay? Sometimes you can have morpheme, affix morpheme that you can put inside, we call infix. The example that uh, uh, we know quite well uh, is the language that has a lot of infixes in their structure. You know what language it is? Very close to our country, you know, on the east. And you know very well. Cambodian. Cambodian has a lot of infixes. You know, it's a kind of uh, pattern. It's a kind of convention. It's a kind of conventional way that you form the word, you know. Uh, for example, you put uh, uh, dal mean walk. Damnern, you put am in the middle. See, just to make dal in uh, Cambodian mean uh, walk. Damnern means walking. Something like that, you know. So this is the way one particular language might have a uh, what we call circumfixes. Circumfix. Uh, circumfix means both. You know, one form of uh, the language might have a morpheme attached or fixed in the front and in the 
follows, you know, after, at the same time, both. So circumfix means at both place or at both position at the same time. Can you give something in the language that you know? You can take think about that, you know. So uh, for the affixes, we might have prefix, we might have suffix, we might have infix, we might have circumfix. You know? This is the way that we call morpheme types. So what I'm going to uh, try to clarify is that in the languages of the world, there are the types of morphemes as such. But it does not mean that all languages must have the whole thing, you know. It doesn't mean that you have to get free bow and affix at the same time in all languages, in every language, because the languages of this world, they have their own selection system that they are going to choose only free to be communicated. They have the right and they have the, their own way to form their language by have only bow morphemes. You know, that is the agree together. And language just happen when, when it does going to uh, happen. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, just started from the very um, early when the, we um, when we are born in this world, right? When we were born in this world, as soon as we were born, we would like to communicate. So, and you know that when we pick up and try to build up language uh, by uh, copying or imitate uh, the parents first and then to school and so on and so forth. Finally, uh, from our study, we can, uh, let's say, use the language by ourselves, the same as the other people in our societies do. So this is the way that we talk about the units of the language that we should pay attention to. I know that all of you, I don't know whether you have uh, study phonology before or not, but I would assume that you did. If not, just let me know, okay? So we can go back a little bit uh, or go over phonology a little bit. In any part that you don't understand, you just tell me. Mm -hmm. Now, when we know about the morpheme types, why we have uh, to know that, you know? In one particular language, we have to understand how they form the shape, how they can make forms, because we can get the right forms to be function, so that we can use the right form and the right function with the right meaning to build up the language that we are going to use it for communicating ourselves with the other members of the society, okay? Let's say that English, uh, the types of morpheme, what are they, okay? You probably have the ideas, you know, further than this, but I would say that in general, the morphemes in English would have, would contain, you know, in English language, contain or consist of morphemes that are both free and bow. For the bow morphemes in English, they have both affix and base. Base means uh, the one that is to be attached by the affix. For the affix, there are two kinds of affixes in English. One is called prefix and another one is suffix, okay? And uh, for the base, I mean the major form that used to be 
fixed by the, the other morphemes we call base. There are two types of base in English, and they are one is stem, and another is root. You know, stem means the base that cannot occur by itself. It has to be fixed with the affix, either prefix or suffix, always to form the meaning, to form what we call the word, you know. And the root means the base that can stand by itself, and they don't mind if the affix is going to be attached to them. See? For example, in English that I gave you before, the word boy, so it can stand by itself. And it doesn't mind if you are going to put z, if you want to make many, many, many a plural. So you can have boys in English, as well as you can have only boy in English. See? For the morpheme, the best morpheme, the best, not the best, okay? The best morpheme that we call stem, like uh, the morpheme went that I gave you before, that it cannot occur by itself. Sieve, C E I V E, it cannot occur by itself. It has to go with either, you know, receive, perceive, conceive all the time. And it doesn't mind to have both prefix and suffix. See? For example, receive d. If you want to make it verb meaning again and again, you know, get again and make it in past form. Something like that. Okay, this is the way that morphemes are constructed in English. Who did that? Oh, long time ago. Since uh, they have the uh, countries, you see, back to 1,000, 2,000 years ago, okay? So this is the way that we call uh, English morphemes, okay? How about uh, the other language that you know? I know that another specific language, one, another particular language that uh, you are familiar with, maybe uh, Banjob and uh, uh, Suna and uh, Bawon Pubet, right, or Jadet, would be very much familiar to Thai language more than the Pak or uh, uh, Venerable uh, uh, Silananta and Nantia. But anyway, since you are in Thailand, it would be nice if you would know what kind of morphemes are there in Thai so that it probably helped you later on to be able to uh, build up or to construct the uh, morphemes into words, into sentences later on, and you can communicate in Thai. This is the, um, um, you know, I think that the advantages of knowing uh, linguistics, see? Just, uh, just help you to be able to communicate with the other people. In Thai, the morphemes are very, I think that for me, it's uh, very, uh, not very complicated. Uh, this uh, comparing with English, it's very, um, very easy, I mean, and very simple to take a look. But the most difficult thing about Thai language is that the meanings of the morphemes or the word, because uh, they vary a lot and it depends on where they are put, you know, in the language, right? In the Thai morphemes, there are two types, okay? You see that they have both free and bow. But the morphemes must take both form, free form, and 
bound form together all the time. They cannot be separated. You know, they have to be you know, agglutinated together, put together all the time. If you have one form of morpheme, you must have bow morpheme together all the time. What are the bow morphemes in Thai language? We call tones, you know? Because the free and the bow in Thai have to be put together just to form different meanings, you know, in the language. And how many tones are there in Thai? There are five tones, okay, in Thai. It means that if you have one free put together with five different tones, you will get five different words, okay? For example, you have free. Bo a ba, right? And you have put five different tones to that form, to that free form, and you get five dif different meanings. If you have mid tone, uh, ba, and you have low tone, ba, and you have falling tone, ba, and you have high tone, ba. And you have rising tone, ba. I understand that you have studied uh, the phonology of Thai language before, right? But otherwise, uh, it's very difficult, you know, to understand what we are talking about at the morphological level. But anyway, I'm not so sure whether you learn that uh, in Thai, free must go with bao all the time. You cannot separate the bow morpheme from the free in this language. I don't know whether anybody just mentioned this before, but according to you know my field, linguistic, I think that I can analyze my language this way. Okay? If you don't agree, okay, we can discuss about this. So this is the uh, morpheme uh, types in Thai, you see that it's very different. In English, for the bow is uh, you call the uh, affix, right? But in Thai, it is tone. So you cannot get the words in Thai without the tones at all. See, this is uh, the way that we describe the language. And if you know this, it's very easy for you because if we put the form you know, the free with the bow, with the mid-tone. For example, ban, it means something, right? And if you put the falling tone to that form, ban, it means something, another thing, right? Something like this, okay? So this is the way uh, that you put uh, the tones. There is a story long time ago that uh, when the you know, people from the West, the foreigners from the West, they just try to uh, study Thai, and nobody explain how to make the tones different from each other. So he could not differentiate So he just say kai, 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 kai. You see, that it doesn't make sense, because in Thai language, you have to know how to use the bow form correctly just to get the right meaning, okay? So uh, even the, the one that I mentioned to you, pa, right? Pa means sutro. Pa with low tone means forest. Pa means ante. Pa means uh, father in Chinese uh, word, in, Chinese, in the Chinese family. Pa means, oh, you see? Uh, the bar girl, you know, if you go into that kind of uh, place and then she just call you bar, it means you have to give her some money later on, you see. 
Okay, this is uh, the different meanings when you put the free and bao together in uh, Thai. Uh, actually, I'm not going to say that uh, I don't want to call it a free form, you know. I don't want to call it a free morpheme. I think that uh, in Thai, actually in Thai language, it should be bao and bao together. We have only uh, bow morphemes in the language. You see? This is because the tone must go with the bass all the time. So the bow in Thai, uh, the first one, instead of writing free, maybe you can call it bass, B A S E. You know, it's a kind of fundamental before you put the tones in. So it means that two bows, one bow is bass and one bow is torn, okay? So you can write down or you can explain or you can describe that way, it doesn't matter, okay? Another specific language that I would like to introduce here is Bali or Bali that you know, you, you know. You know that Bali or Bali in Thai, in Thai pronunciation is a language that is rather close to English because they belong to the same family, right? So it means the structure of the language is quite a little bit similar, but not exactly the same, you see? For the morpheme in Pali, I don't know, venerable, you know more than me, okay? Uh, another six people, you studied Bali before, and you should know uh, about this. Okay, even though I'm now working on Tipitaka uh, translation myself. But uh, according to the morphemes uh, structure or the morpheme types, I think that uh, more or less in Pali, we have, if we call it uh, uh, stem and affix, we probably call that uh, the morphemes in Pali would be bow and bow. And under the first bow would be stem. And under the second bow is affixes. So it means that in Pali, the words must be formed by stem and affixes all the time. Just like a in Thai, bow plus bow. But the first bow of Thai is the bass. B-A-S-E, the bass. And the second bow of Thai is tones. But in Pali, it means stem plus affix. So it means that the form, the first form, cannot occur by itself. It must be the affix all the time either prefix or suffix, okay? For example, the word Buddha. Buddha is not the free form, but Buddha is the one with the zero suffix because when we say Buddha, it's a kind of vocative, you know? It meaning that we are going to call someone, right? Buddha and Buddha. It means that you cannot use the word Buddha alone. You have to put the O suffix, you know, mean something else. So this is the way that when you study a Pali language, you have to understand this, how we can form this. Okay? We, 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 we just have um, Manus, uh, Manus, you have to put sa, so, ena, da at the end as a suffix. You see, this is the way that we study. So, when you study Pali word, uh, the Pali word, you have to study about the morphemes as well at the same time. What just we don't call morphemes, we just say part of the words, you see how to form the words. That is what we call, right, in general term, 
not in linguistics. But in linguistics, we have to try to explain or describe this way. Okay. So um, when we put morphemes together, and it contains, you know, another meaning, ready to be used in the language. Uh, we call it word. So when it becomes a word, how can we describe, you know, uh, the happening or the occurrence of the word? We have two ways to describe, to explain. One way is we just explain according to the horizontal writing or explaining. For example, in English, uh, horizontal uh, description, it means that we are going to explain in linear. <coughs> in linear means in line. For example, the word rewriting. Okay, this is one way to explain. So you have described rewriting as this. Re plus write plus ing. So this is the way that you explain morphemes. So the rewriting, <coughs> there are three morphemes together in this word. Okay. Another way that you can describe or explain the occurrence of the word is the vertical description. It means that when you write uh, explanation in vertical uh, description, you just write down in the shape of what we call three diagram. Okay? If you uh, would like to know who just created this kind of three diagram pattern, you have to go back and read one of the linguistic textbook written by Noam Chomsky. He explained everything in, you know, in tree diagram like this because uh, uh, linguistics is just like, uh, or the language is just like, uh, uh, like human beings uh, be created from the smallest unit. You see, uh, you, you just, you know, human body like this created from the solid part that we call the uh, din in Thai. And you know, the liquid part that we call nam. And the uh, swinging, you know, flowing that we call air or uh, lom, right? And we are created with the combination of these three things with heat that we call fire in Thai. So the four, uh, you know, substances that put together in proper way and proper proportion and proper time, and then human being just happen. Just like, uh, just like uh, the, uh, the language, you know? We just build up the language from very small, the smallest part is sound. Bigger than that would be, you know, uh, morphemes. Bigger than that would be word. Bigger than that would be phrase. Bigger than that would be sentence. Something like that. Okay. So this is uh, the way that language is formed. Okay. Now, when, why we have to, uh, you know, form the morphemes, why we have to study about morphemes, why we have tried to build up the morphemes uh, into words, because we would like to set up the meanings. We would like uh, to uh, be economized enough, you know, to use one morpheme with different form to get the meanings. So you don't have to get the new ones all the time. So this is the way that language works. Yeah under the uh, uh, principle of uh, um, economic uh, um, 
description that way. Okay. Now, the question that uh, we have to ask uh, next after we know about the morpheme types that uh, okay, how or where can we get the morpheme meaning? Okay. If you would like to get the meaning of one particular morpheme or some morphemes, uh, no matter they would be free or bow or bow with stem or uh, the uh, affix or the uh, tones or anything, you just check them from good lexemes text. Lexeme means you know the collection or the list of the morphemes that put together into uh, the uh, shape of uh, words. So if you get lexeme text, mean the list of the words that tell you uh, about the morpheme types as well, that is uh, the good one, you see. For example, glossary. The technical terms in mathematics, in linguistics, in education, in sociology, so on and so forth. We have plenty uh, uh, working by the, the Royal Academy of Thailand that we call Rajabandit Sathan. There are many uh, good uh, lexeme texts that you can study that. Just tell you where uh, the words come from, uh, what kind of uh, original of uh, of each word, uh, just get something like that. We call lexeme text. Or you can take uh, the morphine meanings from good dictionary. I use the word good dictionary because there are so many dictionary. Don't try to buy one by one, one to one, you know, dictionary like this because you won't get anything except very rough meaning. One meaning for one morpheme or one meaning of one. Uh, a word, that's all. The good dictionary must tell you everything about, you know, the type, the origination, and the function, <coughs> and the meaning, you know, and the meanings as well. That is, uh, for example, Webster or Oxford Dictionary or uh, even the Data Digest Dictionary, so on and so forth. Or even the Thai Dictionary, if you would like to get the good uh, morpheme meanings uh, for the Thai language. You just take a look at the big dictionary of uh, the Thai language. So you would know that where the word comes from and how a word is divided into smaller parts, something like that. That is good dictionary. Or you can get the morpheme meanings from glossary. Glossary means a set of uh, or the group of the word with the meaning yeah, in one particular language. For example, English grocery, Thai grocery, Bali grocery, something like that. But sometimes the grocery is not as big as the dictionary itself. Maybe you can have grocery, the group of words in particular uh, uh, intention to be used, see? Or you can get the morphine meanings from the vocabulary list. So in good vocabulary list, it will tell you about the words, the meaning of the words and the morphemes and the combination of morphemes and uh, together that uh, vary into uh, meanings uh, and other meanings as well. So that is what we call vocabulary list. Usually if you have a good text or good textbook, you know, at the end of the book you can have vocabulary list that give you the meaning and give you the function and give you the uh, uh, duty and give you the you know, smaller parts of that. That is the good uh, vocabulary list. So this is the way that you can you know, um, try to get the morphine meanings uh, in uh, good ways. Okay? So now, Suppose that you get a certain uh, number of morphemes. 
The next question that we are going to ask is when you put the morpheme to create the word, you know, what are the types of forming words will be? I mean, the, the words that are formed by morphemes. How many types that you can put the morpheme together to form the words? Okay? We have four different types. When uh, four different types of the word being formed, by morpheme. You know, it means that we have uh, four different ways to form the words from morphemes. One is called inflection. What does it mean by inflection? Inflection means the combination of a word stem, remember that the word stem, you know, with a grammatical morpheme. For example, grammatical morpheme, for example, you know, in written form, you have S at the end of the stem, the word stem. Just make it plural form, right? In English, you have the word cat. And you have to explain, describe about more than one. You just say cats, right? Okay. And if you have uh, the stem, house, House can be a word if it occurs alone. But if uh, it has to be uh, attached with the affix, it will turn to be called stem. Okay? You have the word house. It can, if it becomes a stem like more than one, see, house is, uh, means one, right? If you have more than one, you just put es at the end. So instead of have s, you have to change into es. Why? That is the rule that we call grammatical morphine. Okay. So uh, house, if more than one, it is houses, right? That is the way. Okay. Uh, um, you have the word in English. Bar, B A R, bar. And if you would like to make it become stem, it means that it's a change the form to be put together with the other morphemes. Okay, bar means one, right? If you have more than one, you just put S at the end. That is bars. Okay, S in different places that may be changed into ES or pronounced as voice, that is the change of the form is under inflectional rules in English that you have to learn. When it is pronounced as like cats, you know, when it's pronounced as the, like dogs or bars, when it is going to be like ES, uh, put ES and you have to pronounced as is. I mean, for example, box, boxes. House, houses. Okay? That is the rule that you have to learn about this. In, we call inflection rules or inflectional rules, if you would like to call. But this is the way that you can form. Okay? We talk about forming words first, right? The meaning or the function will be studied later on when we come to morphological uh, analysis in detail. But right now we just have to try to make the background, to make the understanding together first about the meaning of the terms, about the you know, different ways that they call, they have the names, the names related. Okay? Another way that you can form the words from uh, morphemes, that um, when you put the morphemes together, like uh, it is the combination of a word stem with a grammatical morpheme, you see, uh, that you can change the stem position 
it function one thing in the language but when you put uh, another stem to that it change the function for example computer computer is now okay and you can put the suffix is computerize becomes a verb right computerize put asian me and then it will become computerization so that is the noun again you see so when we get the word computerization we just explain that computerization derived is derived from computer plus ice plus asian or you can write down the three diagram of that can you make it try it okay that computerization make the three diagram of uh, that uh, de derivation way of uh, forming the words okay so um, now derivation the function comes or the function intervene you see in the uh, process right another way that we can form the words okay that we call compounding uh, types what does it mean it means that the word is formed with the combination of more than one morpheme it can be okay free morpheme plus free morpheme usually but some can be stem plus stem or some can be root plus root you see depends try to get more example in english yourself so you can practice to understand more before we can have a test a little bit next time okay so the compounding like uh, you have more than one morpheme put together like uh, one morpheme dog see and house and it will be dog house uh, together means something else right uh, 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 so dog house it is something that small maybe it's a it, it is in the shape of like a, a tent or a small building that you put you just decide uh, specifically you know. Um, it is not like the house that we understand or we have seen before okay so this is the way uh, and the fourth type that you can form the words for morphemes we call criticization critic you know it means the uh, combination of a morpheme and a critic critic means abbreviated one for example I have, and then you uh, criticize the form into I've, an apostrophe plus of, V-E, we call critic. That is the way. And we have so many uh, words, you know, when function in the uh, sentence have some kind of this forming way like this either one of them now the question that i would like to ask you how about in your language i mean the language that you are familiar with most of uh, anything else for example uh, okay banjob suna and babon pubet and jadet your language is thai okay and deepak kumar i think that you from either uh, Hindi language used or I, I don't know whether you have from uh, from Bangladesh or from India maybe you have to let me know when we have the lie together just tell me a little bit of your background so that uh, when we have exercise you know you can share with the group with your own language anal analysis okay later on and uh, Jaren Right, 
or oh, I'm not so sure that how do you spell your name this way. According to the name that I have here, Chalon uh, Kiet, I I would uh, pronounce that way, but you probably try to say Chalom Chalom Kiet. Okay. And Venerable uh, Silananta and uh, Nantia, uh, I think that maybe uh, your language is Sinhalese. I'm not so sure. Uh, or maybe, uh, you know, Hindi. Anyway, when we learn about this kind of, uh, you know, types of uh, forming words from morphemes, think about your own language. Can you give example of uh, these um, types? Which one of these four types of uh, forming words from morphemes are used or are applied in your own language? Can you have inflection? I mean you have uh, your words that forming with the uh, stem plus uh, grammatical morpheme or you have derivation or you have compounding or you have criticization this way? Yeah. Okay, so this way, uh, I think that uh, the uh, more example can be given in your own language, in your own experience, uh, this way, okay? So, these are the four different types of uh, forming words from morphemes uh, in any language, you know? So, or the, the four types probably have, uh, you know, the four types probably have, uh, in one particular language, you can have all the four types. Or in your own language, you have only one or two or three. Or one. You know, this is uh, the way that we can form. So you see that uh, forming words from morphemes are very flexible, right? That's what we call in linguistic arbitrary, not very rigid. It can be changed, just like ourselves. We change all the time. You cannot stay at the same place. If you do that, you are not a human being. Okay? So, we can say that word and morpheme are related, right? Because without morpheme, you cannot get the word. And if without the word, you cannot know the morpheme. See? So, this is the reason why do we study words. Besides, we learn how to form the words from morphemes. Okay? After uh, we have put morphemes together to form the words. Why do we have to study words? Why are words very important? Okay? Um, if you take a look at the upper, upper level of uh, those terminology that I just uh, shown you before, you see? Uh, if we have to study words because we have to form, you know, the larger units so that we can have the correction or the correctness of uh, the language that we are going to use. If we have the words, we can form phrases. You know, phrase, phrase means group of words, right? We can form part of speech. It means we, if we have the words, uh, we can give the meaning and we can have more meaning and we can have the function to be put in the language, to be communicated, to be used to be utilized, okay? We have to study word, we have to know, because 
at the lower level. You see that word is in between. You know, above word is fresh. That fresh are going to be just we call a part of speech. You know, together with the uh, with with the words. So word themselves can be part of speech themselves, or they can form the uh, you know bigger unit, larger unit. Put more words together just to form another grammatical unit to the to the sentence that we call phrase. Okay, at the lower level because word is in between, right? The lower level, we have the words. We will be able to identify morphemes. Why do we have to identify morphemes? Because we have to know the meaning. We have to be able to, um, you know, put more morphemes together in the correct way. Okay, so this is the way why we have to study words. Now, when you put morphemes together, either uh, inflection or derivation or um, compounding or criticize. Uh, Criticization, you know, how many types of words that you have? As I have mentioned before, you have three kinds of uh, uh, words in these 6,500 uh, languages of the world. All languages just are formed the same. But different techniques, different morphemes, different uh, different kinds, different process. But as soon as the outcome, I mean the output, uh, has received from forming words, you know, together, all languages would have, you know, either simple, or compound, or complex. In one particular language, you probably have only simple and complex. In one particular language, you have only simple. You never have compound. In one particular language, you can have only compounding and complex. Because, you know, the language would like to have more fun putting words together. See? So the meaning of uh, the simple is that <coughs> the word is constituted from one free morpheme. Okay? The free morpheme means the morpheme that can occur by itself. In Thai, our free morpheme cannot occur by itself. So I'm sorry, maybe we have to change the word free into bao so that you won't get confused. Okay? Because in Thai, you have to go with the tone. You cannot, uh, and if we just consider that tone uh, are morphemes, because it contains different meanings, that is the correct way to mention that. Okay. So, in any language, if the <coughs> morpheme can stand alone, we call free wo the the word. Okay, simple word. It can be short or long. It doesn't matter. I mean, for example, a uh, simple word in English, giraffe, you know, caterpillar, longer than that, but just contain one meaning. We call free morpheme, okay? Example of compound, uh, if you are going to put one free morpheme, or more than one morpheme, you can put morpheme or morphemes with another free morpheme or another free morphemes. We call compound word. Can you give example on that? Okay, I give this. Please check on this and give me example of uh, in your language, okay? You have one free morpheme or not? You have compound morpheme or not? Or you have only complex? Complex word is 
formed by one or more free morphemes plus bow morpheme or plus bow morphemes. If you have more than one morpheme, you know, you can have two suffixes at the end. For example, make a z, makers. See, this is example of complex. You can have bow morpheme, or you can have bow morphemes, followed by another free morpheme or by free morphemes. See? For example, you have the free morpheme uh, uh, position. No, that is uh, 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 pose. Okay? You have free pose. Pose means to put down. You have free uh, pro at the front. You see, that is bow, right? Bow morpheme as prefix. Put propose. See, that is the complex form. Or you can have <coughs> bow morphemes, plus bow morphemes. So it means that uh, either prefix plus stem or plus suffix. You know, you can do that that way. Uh, for example, impossible. You know, those are about im plus pos plus able. Okay? So, this would be three bow morphemes occur together this way. So, there are many ways of uh, forming the words, but no matter what they are formed, you are going to classify into three kinds or three types of words. That's all. Okay? So, this is the way that we just classify the words by studying or putting morphemes together this way. Another question is, you know, uh, how come we have so many types? How come we have so many kinds of words? You know, we have many ways to form the words. Who or where that the words is originated? If we are talking about the origination, of words, you know, the uh, we can say the origination of words may come from the native speaker themselves. For example, how come English has many ways, you know, uh, to forming the words? How come Pali has many ways to uh, form the words? Who did that? Of course, the native speaker, the one who speaks that language, created that way. You see that uh, even though English and Pali belong to the same family, to the same language family, See that they come from Indo-European family, right? But uh, in Pali language, uh, is quite consistent in forming the word. You know, uh, we have a certain set of uh, suffix putting at the end just to form the cases. You know, cases, right? In Thai is vipat. But in English, it's cases. Uh, and uh, we have very consistent of uh, the prefix to put in. For example, uh, 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 in English, they have uh, so many different forms. You know, an, 
uh, in it means not right uh, but in uh, Bali it's quite very consistent if you have one form of prefix putting in every uh, uh, in every stem or in every morpheme it's rather consistent for example you have pati right you have pati in Pali no matter what the, the um, you know the next morpheme gonna be you just be consistent to use that but it, but it means uh, backward right okay so why it happened that way you know because uh, uh, Bali has not changed very much because people stopped using that long time ago right now Bali just exists in the Buddhist text only and uh, the study of the language is just study what they have been created before like that it means that we are going to have one creature's box and inside there are rings from old times there are braces from old times and you just take a look you know and you say that oh it's very uh, precious it's very valuable and you just appreciate that what kind of design that the braces uh, is uh, made something like that so it's just the same way that when you study Pali you just say that oh how the Pali language is constructed and you don't want to change because you just want to save that kind of uh, pattern so this is why Bali is quite different in English but English you know has been used from generation to generation so and you see that from generation of baby boom come down to generation A generation Z generation right now generation me it just changed also so but anyway English can be originated by the native speaker or it is why it is uh, you know not very consistent because you know from ancient time we communicate we just meet each other we just move you know so mobility is uh, happen happening all the time See, since long time ago so when you just uh, contact with people you use language sometimes when you see uh, if you don't have this kind before you know and if the uh, the owner of this uh, thing just has the name for example uh, this one We don't have this one in our language in Thai, but uh, we have this one in English. And uh, the Western people that introduce this kind of stuff, this kind of material, for the first time in the, our country, and we use it immediately tissue. You see, but now later on when we have uh, you know this kind of material and we have seen quite more often and it becomes to be very you know it's necessary in our daily life so we probably create uh, our own language so we just say chamla, right but normally people just use tissue except that they don't uh, pronounce as tissue like the native speaker of english use in the Thai people just do tissue right just uh, you know change into uh, their own uh, pronunciation on their own language use okay so this is the way that why language changes like a human being changes we change our ideas we change our body we change our organs all the time we cannot stay like now I cannot uh, go back to my old age when I was young 
because I would look like this, I cannot go back and you know just set up my face like I uh, was before, <coughs> and my energy during this day would not be like uh, the same uh, in the old days. I'm not very active anymore, something like that. So people change, language change, and the change and the occur of the language. Yeah. We have a lot of words coming into our language. Depends on uh, what kind of uh, you know connection, what kind of uh, you know uh, the um, uh, networking that we set up uh, to communicate with the people of the world. So. In one particular language, you probably have what we call the boring words. You see, uh, sometimes we uh, just have uh, a lot of uh, boring words into uh, our society. I would tell you about our language, Thai. It's very difficult right now when you study morphology of Thai because we cannot uh, easily tell what are the Thai words. You know, uh, long time ago when I study um, my um, bachelor degree, we uh, were taught by our professor that uh, Thai language is monosyllabic type. You know, monosyllabic type, it means that we just uh, have one syllable form in our language. But later on, we have a lot of words, compounding, complex, happen. It is not simple anymore. It is not only one, you know, syllable anymore. Uh, we, we, we call that Thai language is monosyllabic. Syllabic might, it means that the combination of, uh, you know, the consonant vowel plus tone, right? That is uh, the way we create our language. But you see that right now, at the present time, how can you identify? How can you describe morphemes in Thai? Is it uh, only one syllable, syllabic type? No, we have a lot. You know why? Okay. We have a lot of uh, boring words from Pali, true Buddhism, right? You know that. We have a lot of boring words from Sanskrit, through literature, through uh, plays, through drama, that we just get influence from those. You see, uh, we have a lot of boring words from Cambodia because Cambodia is used to be the kingdom the powerful kingdom in this area before, you know, with the uh, Khmer people just uh, taken their civilization from India to this area before. So, you see, we have a lot of boring words from Indonesia until, you know, one time the uh, one of the linguists who study Indonesian and Thai, they just assume that uh, Indonesian language and Thai language belong to the same family because, because we have a lot of cognates. Cognates mean the similar words, you know, using uh, together. For example, in, the, in, in Indonesia, they have the word dike, pakatu. In Thai, we have like and pratu, you see. So, if we don't know the origination of the words, it's very difficult, you know, to just try to tell, to say what kind of uh, uh, morphemes. 
that we have in Thai. So this is I'm going to tell you. So next, when we come to the morphological analysis, uh, you you we are going to discuss over this in detail together. Okay, it depends, and I hope that by that time, we can have on-site class classroom. It means that uh, you people and I can sit down together and we can discuss uh, uh, together about what is in your mind and what is in my thought so that we can share. Actually, if you don't mind, you can come to this university, at Narezun University. This room is quite big enough, you know, for the eight people sit together and discuss together and learn. We have uh, uh, all kinds of technology that you can use. Okay. We hope that by the end of uh, January, we are, the situation of COVID-19 is going to be a little bit reduced and uh, calm down. That's what we hope. Okay. So uh, the words that we see that they are simple, they are compounding, they are complex because of these two things. One is that the native speaker would like, uh, intend to make it more complex, you know, and uh, they would like to be only simple, it depends. But still, in everyday language used in the world, that I said that uh, 6,500, there are a lot of boring words in one particular language, depends on how much they have contact, depends on how much they communicate together, okay? So, uh, if we just go back to language again, from taking a look at the words, at the origination of words, we can say that in this uh, world, we have uh, some kind of language, like uh, we call pure language. We have something like a multi-form and functional language. And we uh, can have an uh, example of the pure language. For example, that I have mentioned to you before, Bali or Bali is a kind of pure. Why it is pure? Because it is put over there and we study only. We are not going to change anything. Because if we are going to change, the meaning is going to change, right? And the quality is going to change. The Dhamma is going to change if we are going to change it. So we just put Bali here, study only as it is. So it is pure for us today, but in the future, in the Buddha's time, it might not uh, be pure as we think it is right now, right? By that time, it probably mixed together because India at that time, they have a lot of uh, different tribes, different ethnic groups coming back and forth in that area. Maybe it's uh, mixed already, but right now we have to say that uh, Bali represents one of the pure languages of the world. Okay, for the mixing one that have multi forms and multi function, you know, it becomes the language that mixing one. We can take a look. I think that. We have uh, right now 6,500, more than 6,500 spoken in this world, and we have a lot number, a big number of uh, written forms uh, in this world. And we call that all of those languages are activating, means still, you know, we're using it, still we're changing it, still we utilize, still we transfer, you know. So I think that. The languages of the present world, of the present day, are the mixing one. 
I don't know whether you agree or not, but you have to tell, you know, what do you think about this, okay? So I think that next time we can uh, consider what we uh, can um, arrange our, you know, meeting or our class in, in some better way, I think, unless the COVID-19 is going to stay with us longer than we expect, okay? But anyway, before we come next time, I would like uh, you to wrap up what uh, we have discussed today together about uh, 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 the meaning of uh, morphology, you know, uh, the morphemes that we are going to take a look at, what kind of morphemes we have, and uh, why do we have to uh, study morphemes, uh, why words that come from putting morphemes together are very important, why do we have to use language, you know, and what kind of language that we are using now in the present day, what is the difference from the language that we are going to study without any uh, touching or changing at all, okay? So, um, for the uh, assignment for next week, I would like to do this way, okay, you take a look at this uh, exercise and then you just, uh, can you make it? And uh, uh, sending to me through my email before we start our class next uh, weekend so that I can explain to you what uh, do you think about this or if you have any question, you, if you cannot make it, you just write down and let me know or uh, through either my email or through our line that we are going to put together. I don't know who is the leader of the class among your eight people here, but uh, I think that uh, you have my uh, you have my phone number, right? My mobile phone that uh, you can invite me to be your group because I know that eight of you, you have your live group already. So you just add me another one person in your group. And if I uh, receive that and uh, I can get your assignment, uh, so we can discuss over that for a quite short time. And uh, if it is over, we can meet. Uh, so you can come here or I can go over there, you know. But today, for what you are going to uh, try to prove that you understand and you think that it is very useful to yourself so that you can uh, try to take this kind of uh, ideas that we, we discussed together to apply for your further uh, uh, study like uh, for your thesis or for your uh, uh, your paper that you are going to propose before you finish your degree